Good afternoon, everyone. We'll just wait for five minutes until more participants are in, and then we can proceed with the webinar. Please share with us in the chat box the country you are based in. Few minutes and we'll proceed. We can see a lot from Jordan, from Saudi Arabia, welcome, Egypt, Emirates. So welcome everyone. We'll just wait a few minutes. We also have participants from Bahrain, from Kuwait. Welcome everyone. Okay, two minutes and then we can start. We have 200 something so far, and I think we can start. Okay, so good evening, everyone. Welcome to QRTA talk. Uh, please share with us in the chat box the country you are based in. Just a few guidelines before we start. I would like to highlight that simultaneous translation into Arabic is available and is activated through the globe icon, which will appear in seconds on the Zoom screen at the bottom. Note that the original sound must be muted to hear clearly. 
أحب أن أنوه توفر خدمة الترجمة الفورية للغة العربية والتي يمكن تفعيلها من خلال أيقونة الكرة الأرضية أسفل شاشة زوم الرجاء ملاحظة أنه يجب وضع الصوت الأصلي على الصامت للاستماع بوضوح To obtain a certificate of attendance, you must attend at least half an hour and must fill in your data, from, your data form through the link that will be shared after 30 minutes in the chat box. Please note that broadcasting of this webinar is available via Facebook Live. However, you need to register via Zoom to be eligible for the certificate. We highly appreciate you fill out the feedback survey, which will be posted in the chat box at the end of the webinar. This survey will also open automatically upon completion of the webinar. We are pleased today to welcome with us Nadine Khoury, who is going to enlighten us about the power of coaching conversations. I'm really excited about today's webinar, Nadine, and the ideas you will be sharing with us today. Nadine is an executive and leadership coach and director of Nadine Khoury Consultancy an executive development and leadership training organization that positively impacts productivity, performance, and profitability around the world. She works with multinationals, governmental organizations, national and international ministerial teams, and has influenced educational policies and leadership processes, which have become best practice. She's an international school inspector and a lead inspector in private and government schools, in Emirates, Asia, and Africa. She's an ICF executive and leadership coach. She works with senior leaders to evaluate, elevate, and accelerate school improvement strategies. Her particular areas of expertise are in school improvement work, school leadership, coaching, governance, school self-evaluation, evaluation of school development plan, and continuous professional development. Nadine is currently embarking on a part-time PhD, how hope determines the outcome of a difficult conversation related to performance in business context. She's a mom of four grown-up children and a grandmother. Please don't say that, Nadine, to anyone. It doesn't <laughs> <laughs> Please note that if you have any question, write it in the, quality, uh, in the Q and A box, not the chat box, but the Q and A box, and Nadine will be able to respond to as many questions as possible during the last 10 minutes. Thank you, Nadine, for being with us today. Can't wait to hear more about this. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. I'm just going to uh, share my screen um, right now. Can You can see my screen, yes? Yes, we can see that. Okay. Well, first of all, um, thank you very much for inviting me. I feel um, a privilege to be here with everybody today and, and, and with all those people from all over the world. So thank you very much. Marwa for this wonderful introduction. Um, I feel very flattered actually, it makes me feel really good at what, uh, what you said about me. Um, I would just add one thing and I'm going to start with the, with, with the, with the why. Um, when I um, do presentation, I always want to understand the why I'm doing that. And when um, Osama uh, invited me to do that presentation today, I was very keen to give back to the community and I was very keen to talk about coaching because for me, coaching is a tool to create opportunities to grow. And I wanted to specifically talk about conversation because it's a language and it's how we communicate. It's about the importance of words, of the voice, of the tone of voice, of the silence, actually, of the questions that we ask, the body language. It's about how we manage emotion and it's about our listening skills. And talking about our listening skills, actually, I always think that listening skills are in 5D. There is what is being said, there is how it's being said, there is what is not being said, there is what is actually being said, and there is what is um, actually meant. Um, so I'm going to be taking you through that presentation, hopefully give you some ideas about the power of coaching. And by the end uh, of the session, you are going to be able to probably use um, some of the tips I'm going to give you and also start uh, disrupting a little bit, but disrupting positively in terms of the conversations that you're gonna have with people. So when I um, do uh, coaching, uh, I always encourage people to think about their thinking space and 
to think about the location. Are you going to have that conversation uh, inside or outside of a building? And I remember not so long ago, I was in Paris and one of the school leaders there said to me, can we get out of the school? Can we go and walk in a park? And I think that there is no right place to have a conversation and to have a coaching conversation. It's what's best for um, the coachee, so the person who is being coached. The environment is also very important because we are using our senses um, and some people will be um, sensitive to colors. Uh, you've probably worked with the psychology of colors. I like white, everything is white around me because white is clarity for me. But I know that some people prefer blue, some people prefer green, some people like to smell things. Um, and I remember when I was a, a school principal that my staff used to say that my office um, smelled like a, a spa, you know, when you go into a spa, because there are scents that are really good to, um, for your concentration. Um, and I tended to use, to use that precisely um, to, for, for the conversation, to set the tone of, of the conversation. And, and a coaching conversation is all about thinking process because here is me as a, as a coach. Um, I'm going to make you think. I'm going to um, pro probably change your mindset, probably shift your mindset, probably uh, create that aha moment uh, when we are having that discussion. And you may want to, um, to write things down. Uh, you may want to record on your uh, iPhone. Again, there is no um, set ways of doing it. But um, I think it's important to make sure that uh, you take something away from the conversation. And often uh, people are um, aware of what's best for them in terms of um, making sure that um, they, they note somewhere some of the key points. So the first thing I want to, to talk to you about is the definition of coaching. Now, you will have seen um, on LinkedIn that there is a, a search of coach. Um, and when I think about coaching, uh, I think about Harvard and I think about ICF, ICF be, being the uh, International uh, Coaching Federation. And I belong to, to ICF. I actually, uh, my qualification is from ICF. And I just wanted to compare the definition between Harvard and ICF. Harvard talks about performance and ICF talks about potential. And I like the word potential because I think that we are never a finished product. And I love the fact that a coaching session can make you grow. If you look at the definition about ICF, it goes a lot further than Harvard. It talks about thought provoking. So thought provoking in terms of challenging your assumptions, challenging your opinions, challenging your hypothesis, challenging your perception, challenging the gaps that you may, may have in terms of your mindset, so that you start thinking about different possibilities. And this is what we mean by potential. You evolve through the conversation. And I've always thought that um, as an educationalist, I think that we have a uh, duty in our life as a um, working in education, I think we have a, a, a duty to, uh, well, first of all, to take care of people, a duty of care, and making sure that in our conversation, we're always impeccable with words. Um, I have seen too many conversations where people were forgetting to be respectful, probably because of what's happening in the um, school environment, probably because of the lack of focus, probably because of the pandemic and the toll that it's taken. But I think it's important in our words to be impeccable. And also we have a legacy and the legacy to create future leaders and future leaders who um, must communicate effectively because the best leader communicates effectively. So what I want to share with you is um, examples of focus uh, of coaching conversations that I've had with school leaders during my inspections, during um, the work on school improvement work that I do with them. The first one is about pressure. There is absolutely no doubt that school leaders have had to do more with less. They've had to do things quicker and to respond quicker. You know, um, suddenly we've gone from um, face to face to hybrid um, to then distance learning to then hybrid 
the system is changing quite a lot. And they've had to manage complex uh, situations that they've not been trained for. And I'm thinking about, um, for example, um, COVID. COVID, nobody was prepared for. And all of us listening here on that webinars, none of us in our teaching qualification have been prepared for COVID. Um, some of us may, may have um, qualified as um, part of the NPQ, the National Professional Qualification, but that was not in there. So the pressure that we've been under, actually, we were not prepared for. Yet we have to recognize that through resilience, uh, many school leaders have been able to uh, overcome uh, pressure because of the, and thanks to the conversations that they've had with their peers, with their network. And it's important to know when you're under pressure, you know, where can you go? What are the network that you have? And it's always a question that I ask in a coaching session. So who can help you? That's the first question I would ask if you are under pressure. The second one is about accountability. And accountability is something that I often refer to when I, uh, for example, we look at the school evaluation, we look at the school um, uh, development plan. And it's about the ability of people to understand what is expected of them. Um, you know, how they can exercise authority and also how can they take responsibility for delivering the results. So if their job description isn't very clear um, or um, if we are communicating um, in, in a very vague ways, then people are not going to understand what is expected of them and therefore they won't have a sense of accountability because um, they, they won't know, they won't understand. So making sure that role responsibilities, um, school evaluation, um, school development plan, making sure that it always, um, it's always specific about who does what, when, um, and the success criteria so that everything is clear, so that everybody understands uh, the role they, they have to play. Here, I tend to think about uh, Jim Collins, who says that you know, everybody needs to, see, to sit in the right seat. Um, and accountability is like that. If you're sitting in the right thing, in the right seat, doing the right job, then you will perform well. You will deliver the results. And that leads me to driving performance because you know, no matter what is happening, school leaders, schools are expected to continue to drive performance, to drive growth, to continue to innovate. And we can't juggle everything. We have to make some choices. So uh, again, one of the questions that I ask in um, that kind of scenario is, okay, so what could you abandon? What are you going to keep? What are you going to shift? What are you going to modify to formulate that new uh, plans to drive, to continue to drive performance? And then comes uh, the team discipline. So the team disciplines here, it's about roles, it's about responsibilities, and it's about routines. Um, we all have routine in a school, and in the best school that I've been, um, routines are linked to system leadership. Um, they're linked to school policies. They're linked to clarity of the self-evaluation of the school development plan. So it's about the contribution that people are making uh, to those policies and those system process. And therefore, um, it's about the alignment that people have. And in the coaching conversation that you can have, it's about reflecting on those alignments and where uh, alignments work very well and where perhaps we could make it work uh, better. And all of that comes with the power of communications because you know, we communicate um, using four skills. We are listening, we are reading, we are writing, and we are speaking, okay? So that in itself seems to be fairly simple. However, it isn't simple because if you're not using the right words, if you're not using the, the right language, um, the communication is, isn't going to be clear. So one of the exercises that I often do when I go to work in a school or even doing an inspection actually is I, I talk about the vision and I try to understand what the vision uh, of the school is. And I ask several people, you know, so what is the vision of the school? Uh, just, just to check the, the alignment. What are the values 
And that's a very interesting exercise to do when you're working in a school. Uh, what are the values of the school? Because sometimes you get into a school and you see some lovely displays, but actually people demonstrate different values and people understand different values. I, I don't think there is a right or wrong necessarily. I think that it's important to be, to be aligned. And if the values are not aligned, if what people are telling you uh, doesn't align, it means that communication somewhere um, isn't working. So time to do something about it. And then one of my last uh, coaching conversation is about impact. It's about capacity to improve. Because in any schools, even when I go into outstanding school, and I have been to outstanding schools, particularly uh, on my latest visit uh, in UAE, um, looking at the succession plan, looking at the risk assessment, always asking, you know, um, can you go higher? Can you, go, can you do better? Can you be more cost effective? And at the moment, a lot of schools are working with tight budgets. So, you know, can you be better value for money? Um, so all of the, the, those questions that you can, uh, you can ask when you are focusing um, your conversations around coaching to make people grow. So in the way that my mind works as Nadine Parry, um, there are three words that are really important for me and that are uh, actually my trademark. So one is evaluate and evaluate is always about uh, the current checks. So starting with where you are and evaluating where you are and kind of looking at uh, the seeds of change. Then it's elevate and elevate is a little bit like um, you know, you're at the airport and the plane is uh, going, uh, it is taxiing, and then the plane is going to take off. So that's the takeoff. And then accelerating is about the flying high. When you are at, uh, you know, 40,000 uh, altitude, you're really flying high and you're flying fast. And to be able, you might, you know, you might be look, watching me and you might think, well, it's all jolly good, but how, how do I do that? I would say that uh, in everything you do about coaching and coaching conversation, there is always a positioning to have. And I've used the work from uh, William Bridge and William Bridge is a change consultant and he wrote a very interesting book back, I think it was 1991, uh, which is managing transition because actually, um, I don't think it's change that is the most difficult. And when I have conversation with school leaders, it's not the change that is difficult. It's actually the transition. Um, so how are you going to position the coaching conversations that you have to position um, the conversation? So is your conversation that you're about to have, you know, um, at the ending of a, a timeline? Are you in a transition zone? And most of the time, this is where you're going to be. Um, or are you at the new beginning? Now, many schools right now are in between transition um, and the new beginning. So it's important to understand where you are in that conversation and how you can position it so that you can start thinking about um, the context, about uh, the references, about the words, about the questions, and equally about the silence. And I did mention the silence earlier on. One of the questions that I used to um, uh, ask when I was a school principal was, um, I would see my staff and I would say to them, so how do you want to travel? Uh, would you like to travel first class or would you like to travel economy? And most of my staff said to me, well, we'd love to travel first class, but we can't quite, um, we don't really have the means, you know, the, fi the financial means to, to travel first class because it's quite expensive. And yes, of course it is very expensive. I've actually, never travel first class, but I think that you can uh, behave um, as if you were traveling first class. You can talk as if you are uh, a first class, if you've thought about um, how you are going to be having those conversations. What I'm trying to say is you don't need to be in first class to behave um, and have first class conversations. I don't know if you um, have heard about Tony Robbins. He's a great guy, um, you know, big on all the, the, the social media. And he said something about English language. And he said that um, our common vocabulary is about 2,000 words, but we only use 
um, 200 to 300 words um, as our um, daily vocabulary. So we go from having 2,000 words possible to just using 200 words. And that shows you that actually the choice of words and how we choose to use them is absolutely key. So what I want you to start thinking about is, okay, we've all got a, a leadership style. We've, you know, we've all got uh, our own DNA. And what are the, what are the words that you, you know you're using all the time and that you are happy with? And what are the words or, you know, the questions that you think, gosh, I'm, I'm asking that question quite a lot. Um, and start being quite sensitive to, to what you are asking people. Start making notes. Um, I wouldn't say start recording yourself, but if you are a courageous leader uh, or a courageous teacher, record yourself and have a look at the habits that you have. Have a look at how you talk to people, how you look at them. You know, um, I mean, I'm French and typically I'm using my hand quite a lot. Um, but do that little exercise and reflect on that. And it will, it will be quite revealing, trust me. So we talk about effective communication and it's really important to know that, um, yes, 7% is, is about words, sure but 55% is about body language. So actually the body language um, may be more important than your words. Tone of voice being 38%. So again, it's, the, um, it's a little bit like an association of it's the words, it's your tone of voice, and it's going to be the body language. So effective communication, whenever you talk, whenever you have those coaching conversation is the triangle between those three. So again, try to remember um, your tone of voice, how you speak. Um, I know that when I am very passionate about things, I know that I tend to talk quite quickly because I want to say a lot. Um, but actually talking quite quickly isn't always the answer because some people who are receiving uh, that conversation with whom you are talking, might be slightly overwhelmed, might be tired to listen to you. So really we need to just be aware about our words, about our tone of voice and about um, our body language. And you know, choose your words is about choosing your um, impact. Everything is about impact, you know? Um, if you are having a co conversation with somebody, you need to ask yourself, why am I having that conversation? What do I want to get out of it? And if you can't justify that, then don't have that conversation. That would be my advice. So we are evaluating and evaluating is all about uh, self-awareness. And we always say that the best leader, leaders are those who are very self-aware. And I've written down some, some question here that I ask my, um, my coaches, you know, who, who am I? Um, who do I want to be? What are my feelings as, as a leader? What am I struggling with? What am I wanting most of? And, and what am I fearing most? Because um, that's also um, really key. Coaching questions are not always um, questions about happiness. They're actually questions that are going to challenge you, but challenge you um, in, in, in a nice way, because I mean, you don't have to respond straight away. You can choose to be silent because you're thinking. But it's always very interesting to do a, a, a kind of mini SWOT analysis about yourself, about your journey, and to, to understand actually where you are and where you are going um, to, to go. And some of the questions that um, I, I tend to continue to ask are about um, questions specifically about yourself, you know, your passion. Um, what's holding you back? What are the triggers for your, you know, for, for your needs? Um, what is your legacy? Um, I think it's really important to constantly ask yourself questions. When I was a, when, when I was a principal, I would have a, a coach um, and I would talk to her. Being a principal is a very lonely uh, place, um, very lonely place. Even though you may have a lovely, fantastic leadership team, it's a lovely place to be. Um, and I remember, you know, some tough decisions you have to make. And ultimately, it's a team decision, but, you know, your name is, uh, is there. Um, and I remember talking to my coach every month, and we would go through some of those questions. 
And that would make me reflect. And it would, at the end of the day, it would make me, I would know myself better and I would be able to make uh, better decisions. And, you know, sometimes um, it's not always about what we see. Um, and sometimes it's about the depth. And coaching is really good to get to uh, the what you can see. Um, because some people and, you know, maybe people in your team are very good um, on when you when you see them, um, you perceive and you understand what they say. But actually, you know, if you look uh, underneath, if you start to think about what you can see, then you are going to be going into feelings. You're going to be going into perceptions. And I mentioned at the beginning, you know, perceptions, assumptions, all the um the beliefs that people have that don't necessarily want to talk about, um, but actually that might be challenge and that might explain why somebody is behaving in a particular way, you know, for example, in, in a staff meeting. Um, and you can use that as well with some parents, um, you know, those difficult parents who come into school and who can be quite upset and rightly so. And sometimes we don't get it straight away. It's because you know, if you go underneath the layers, it's a bit like peeling an onion. So you remove the layers and then you can see what's underneath and then you understand um, you, you understand why people are behaving uh, the way they do. Now, nobody would be surprised because I've now uh, put the, uh, the six hats from the Bono. I love the six hats, actually, and I used to uh, use them when I was a teacher myself. Um, and the six hats, they've always influenced me to ask questions, absolutely no doubt about it. Um, and you know how you want your stakeholders to be. So not only your staff, but also your governors, your parents, you know, the community, how you want them to be, to feel, to think. Um, I think by thinking about those, those, uh, those colored hats and thinking about what they represent um, and um, thinking about how you can shape your questions, will be very helpful. And equally, um, if you're a school leader and if you're preparing an important document, uh, perhaps, you know, school improvement plan or perhaps, you know, something new that you want to develop in school, um, it's always quite um, useful to actually use those thinking hats to um, go through the thinking process of um, what you want to, what you want to talk about to people, because then you preempt, you predict, you anticipate, um, and you are capable to communicate better what you want to say. Now, of course, you may say to me, well, Nadine, we've got some psychometric tests and that is fine. Yes, psychometric tests might be fine. So DISC, uh, Myers-Briggs, you know, it can be fine, but I find that with them, there was um, a snapshot of a specific moment in time. Um, so, um, I'm always a little bit um, uh, careful about, um, about them. Now, I want to talk to you about uh, some podcasts that I did. So um, um, I don't know if you've seen my website, but on my website, um, I've done um, a podcast called Leading the Coaching Change. And I have um, recorded 100 podcasts, so 100 podcasts. And uh, most of them have invited leaders from around the world to talk and we've had a coaching conversations. And on this podcast 50, number 58, I invited, invited uh, Tarek Alami. So Tarek is somebody that I know quite well. Um, he's the regional director for MENA Africa and Asia for EDT. And I invited Tarek to talk about um, how to be a successful boss, right? And that can apply to how to be a successful school leaders, right? Because whether you work into the business world or whether you lead a school, actually um, the same issues, the same um, opportunities are, are going to come. And with Tarek, we talk about the greatest asset in an organization. And we both agree that the greatest asset are people, so human capital. So this is why your conversations with people must be absolutely key because you want to keep them, you don't want to, a, a turnover that is that is high, although it's healthy to have a turnover, but you don't want one that is too high. So you need to motivate people. You need to be the, you know, to continue to be the change leader, um, but you also need to have return on investment. So 
Um, it's all of those conversations that you can have with people to ensure that um, you, know, you continue um, to drive performance. But Tarek said something really interesting about um, when we are talking about conversations. And um, he said to me, he said, um, we need to talk about the sixth sense. And I was thinking, oh, what is the sixth sense? And the sixth sense is about intuition. So when you're having a coaching conversation with people, so for example, if you're having a conversation with me, a coaching conversation with me, you're going to say something and then I'm going to say, oh, I'm sensing that. Um, I'm sensing that you're not very happy here. Um, and the fact that I, I'm saying I'm sensing, it's a little bit like I'm, I'm kind of using my intuition here. Uh, I'm feeling that. Um, so I'm trusting that, my intuition. And that those conversation needs, they tend to crop up when you have your one-to-one uh, -one meeting. So you may have your weekly one-to-one -one meeting with your senior leadership team, you know. So the importance of how you structure those meetings and how the frequency of those meetings so that, um, you know, people can see that you have trust in them, that you have faith in them so that they can, they can open, you know, they can talk to you in confidence and share with you how, how, how they are feeling. I think it's really important to make people feel heard when they are talking to you. It's important to um, understand, choose the right language and making sure that uh, at the end of the conversation, remember the why, that conversation was actually uh, useful for, for you, for them, for the organization. That's, uh, that's really important. Now we, talk about uh, elevate. So remember, we have evaluate and then we elevate and elevate is the takeoff. And I spoke about uh, the style of leadership because um, we all have a different DNA and elevate is about process. It's about your systems. It's also about your language and it's also about the behavior. But remember that the language isn't always about speaking. Um, I don't know if you've done that exercise of um, trying to be silent. So you're listening to somebody and you're really making a point to not interrupt. You see, one of the, one of the, my areas of development when I was much younger uh, was that I was so passionate that I would interrupt people. And that is so rude, right? That is not right at all. And I feel myself when I was a teacher and I realized actually how much interruptions, and it was not because, um, I had not been brought up well, right? It was just because I was keen to say something. Uh, I was thinking about my response when people were talking to me. So I was not listening in the end. Um, so taking off here is about making sure that you are, um, you know, you are listening. You can be silent and it's okay to be silent. Um, when you think about performance management, when you think about um, uh, teaching and learning, there's so much, um, you know, behind the scene is such a huge process behind the scene that it's really important when you have those conversations that you are listening to listening to people because actually people can have great ideas and if you interrupt people you can um, you 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 can make them stop having that aha moment you know that moment when they've got a magical ideas and you just you just destroy that because you interfere with their thinking process. Um, and it's important to continue to innovate. Um, so it's important to encourage in our conversation, it's important to encourage people to be creative, to be innovative. Um, and it's the same for the language, you know, when we talk about the vision and the values, and it's the same about behavior. We have to talk, we have to walk the talk. So if you're a leader, you have to walk the talk. So whatever you say, you have to role model what you say. So if you are saying that you are, um, you know, you, you're not going to be interrupting, then do not interrupt and make sure that um, you stick to that. Make sure you, that you preach what, what you say, um, it's important. I do want to talk about Yacinda Arden and you won't be surprised about that. I mean, she's the prime minister in New Zealand. She's a, we call her the standout leader. Um, and I'm, I want to speak about her because I recently had, I was uh, coaching a school leader, a female in UAE. And she, when I asked her um, who, who, 
could influence you? And she, out of the blue, she said, well, yes, in the Arden. And I said, oh, okay, you know, so how would she do that? Um, and we talked about um, the language that Yacinda is, is using. If you, uh, one of the exercises that I would encourage you to do actually is to, um, is to think about somebody who is influencing you and, and watching them on the, on the media and watch their language, watch their body language. And that's the exercise that I did with that school leader. So we knew that that school leader would be able to influence uh, we knew that Yacinda would be able to influence um, that school leader. So we looked at the communication. We looked at the body language. Um, we looked at the silence and we analyzed, I think it was about 20 minutes of the conversation. And then we compared and contrasted with my school leader who um, was able to say, actually, I'd quite like to borrow that. I'd quite like to borrow those questions. Um, I love the way she's silent. I love the way she's really looking at people, you know, the, the eye contact. And, and that was a really good exercise to do. So, you know, just um, as, a, as a training for you, if you want to, um, to practice, um, then do choose, you know, somebody around the world and, and watch how they are uh, on social media and learn from that. I want to go back to one of my podcasts. So that's another one. Uh, and this one is with Simon Harmer. So Simon Harmer, Simon is the director of uh, Thursday. And Thursday is a creative agency. Nothing to do uh, with teaching, but everything to do with innovation and creativity. And I think we all need a Simon Harmer in our schools. And I invited to... Um, to Simon to speak with me to talk about disruptive leadership and when I talk about li disruptive leadership I don't mean uh, chaos I don't mean creating chaos in the school at all uh, when Simon talked he said disruptive leadership is about asking yourself why do you do it this way and is there a better way to do it and that's, that's what I would like to encourage you to think about when you have your coaching conversation. So you're with your team, you're with your colleagues, you're with the parents, you're with the stakeholders. You know, you've got a fantastic sessions where everybody's co-constructing with you, okay? And ask those questions. So why do you do it this way? And can we do it? Is there a better way to, to do it better? you know, follow your guts, create, innovate, and take calculated risks. And you can do that. You can do that in teaching and learning. I mean, I inspected um, quite a few schools actually recently, and everybody has been disruptive positively in those schools because they've created um, new approaches, new processes that are actually much better, less costly, quicker than before. Same with assessment, because of course, you know, the fear was um, during the pandemic, the fears was what are we going to do with, with assessment? Um, and many schools have reviewed their assessment policy. So it's not about marking more, okay? It's marking less, but marking better. Same with uh, well-being. Um, well-being is absolutely key on school's agenda. The well-being of the staff, the well-being of the students, the well-being of the parents. And you know, there's some fantastic um, apps, technology that schools are using now that they were never using before. So we can be, we can be disruptive and we can make, um, by asking the right questions, we can make things move uh, in the right directions. So I go back to um, um, my favorite questions that I ask uh, when I talk about disruption, you know, how can I create new ideas? And actually um, it's very hard to have new ideas, right? Um, but it's taking the time uh, with your team to, to have a blank piece of paper and to think about new ideas and to think about the risk of not changing. Actually, what's the risk of not changing? In everything I do um, in my life, I ask myself, if, you know, what's the risk of not doing that? So for example, when I was invited um, you know, to that, uh, to, to do that webinar, what's the ring, what's the risk of not doing, um, that, uh, that presentation? Well, uh, the risk of not doing it, I, I, I mean, you know, 
I want to, to meet you. I can see that we've got 512 participants, you know, so I'd love to be on stage and, and you know, be able to be able to see you. Um, so think about the, the risk of not doing something. And to me, there was, uh, there's not any risk, okay? Um, I'm here in England and I'm doing my presentation and I hope very much that you're enjoying it. Um, and I want to give you uh, some final ideas. And this is probably more when you're working in teams and when you are having those conversations. So this is a, a document that I use when I work with schools. Uh, when we focus on communications and communications to, to be an effective leader, okay? And that can be with your teams, that can be with the, uh, when, you, when you're preparing a meeting with the, uh, with the board of governors or when you are preparing a meeting with your senior leadership team. Um, and this is a tool, this is my planning tool because this is about um, influencing. When you're having a coaching conversation, um, you might want to think about some ideas that you have, but equally, you need to know your audience um, because you need to adapt the way you are talking. You're not going to be talking in the same way when you talk to your parents than when you talk to your governors and the way you talk with your, you know, with your students. Um, so it's about making sure that you understand the relationship that you have with those people and that you know them and, and that you understand how they think how do you want them to feel how do you want them to think because if you're clear about that you're going to have clarity about the language that you are using you're going to be asking the right question um, i don't know if you've done that exercise before but um, if you have observed a meeting uh, if you go as a silent observer in a meeting and many schools are doing that um, when i do inspections um, i'm asked at times if um, schools can put one or two observers so that they they learn right so in leadership succession that i was talking about at the very beginning and i think that's a very good exercise to understand your audience and if you've done that exercise, you will um, quickly understand that actually um, we all have a, a different way to communicate and we all have our own DNA and we all have the same uh, interest, right? So I have some interest, you have different interest. And we, if we understand the DNA of everybody around the, the table, actually it's going to make it easier to communicate with those people. So that little exercise, right? You might think, well, I haven't got time to do that because uh, I've got too much work. Well, I challenge you to, to do that exercise. Take half an hour on your schedule and start mapping out. And you will understand that actually there are some trends, there are um, observations that you are making because you're taking the time to think strategically. There are observations that you are making that will help you in your communication, in the way that you communicate with people. And then it's about um, making sure that you, uh, you kind of uh, close the gaps, you know, you shape that conversations. And here it's more about your, um, your self-awareness about, um, about yourself. There is what you want. Uh, there is the, you know, what could support uh, what you want and what would happen if I change my daily action. It's a very interesting exercise to self-reflect that I use um, a lot uh, in, in my coaching. Then if you do all of that, you're, you are ready indeed to, uh, to accelerate and you are ready to, uh, to take new habits and to form new habits actually in your day-to-day -day and in the way that you are communicating with your team. So um, to finish off, I want to share with you the uh, questions that I used to uh, share and I used to ask my team when I was a school principal. And those were the weekly meeting that I would have with my team. Um, you know, what, what have you changed this week that would never be the same again? And the first time I asked them that questions, they were completely shocked, but then they got used to it. And those questions elevated the weekly conversations. You know, I talked about values at the beginning and I said to my, to my staff, how do you model the values of our school this week? How do, what did you do to model that? Um, and it made them, all reflect actually more how they were demonstrating the values and then you know ask anybody in the school everybody would know about the values because we would have spoken about it so those are very powerful questions that i've used with my teams and 
that have it's worked it's absolutely worked if you ask them on a regular basis and for me it was on a weekly basis so i was very consistent with everybody so i hope that i've managed to uh, convince you that um, you know um coaching is powerful and can shape your conversations and i hope that you're going to be you're going to become um, a disruptive leader where you're not going to create chaos, but you're actually going to think differently. Um, and I hope that I have challenged your thinking for you to start uh, something new. So please feel free to contact me, leave me a recommendation, send me um, a note, anything. I'd love to continue that conversation. And I thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nadine. That was really insightful. I took actually a lot of notes today. Thank you for sharing such ideas with us. And thank you for sharing such questions that would really help us to think in a better way. I love what you said about uh, using the iceberg as a metaphor and what you said about it's not about what you see and coaching is about what you cannot see. So that's really insight insightful and really um, it's it's a, actually a big change in the way we think. And thank you for sharing that. Uh, Nadine, we can take some of the questions. Sure. Uh, we, um, some questions here in the, in the box. So I'll start with a question here. How could I prepare for a coaching conversation with my students in earliest levels? That how is could, a question by Iman. How could I prepare for... for okay. How so, could I prepare for a coaching conversation with my students in earliest levels? I think Iman is specifically asking for earlier um, grades, particularly. Sure, sure, sure. I, I think I would um, I would just start with their interest and their passion, and and I would just start with that um, and an understanding, um, you know, who, who who they are, and and see where the conversation is uh, is going and takes them because. I mean, if we are talking about early years, um, you know, or even grade one, they, those are very, very young children, right? Um, and sometimes you can't, I mean, most of the time, actually, you can't quite predict where those are going to go. Um, so, so start with what they are passionate about, what, what are they interested in, you know? Um, and if they are um, a little bit shy about talking, maybe give them... Um, something to start the conversation, you know, show them a drawing, show them a picture, show them something that is in the classroom and start with that conversation. I remember I went to a, a great lesson not so long ago um, and uh, the teacher uh, asked, what is kindness? How can we be kind? Um, and that was a fabulous conversation because kindness is a value, right? And it happened to be the value of the school. And all the children had something to say about kindness um, and they all gave an example of how kind they'd been during that week. Um, and I thought that was really, really nice. Um, so I, I would do that. Thank you. Thank you, Nadine. There's another question here. Can you advise of the books for body language? Um, and uh, not, and uh, do you do more online training? <laughs> Okay, yes, um, I will be able to advise a book on body language. Uh, there is certainly one on coaching, which is from um, Claire Pedrick. Um, I've got it in my, I, I can, I can, I will be able to advise. I think I, I have said that I will put um, a list um, at the end of the session where I will, yeah, I, I'll put a list of books actually, but Claire Pedrick is a coach who has written um, and she talks about body language a lot. So um, I think that would be the start, but I can give you more books. And the second question was? Uh, do you do online training? Yes, I do online training. Um, I do online training and I do face-to-face -face training. Um, I, it doesn't matter where I am, uh, anything is possible. So yes, I do online training. You just need to contact me and um, we, can, um, we can arrange, yes. There's another question, Nadine. Um, can we combine coaching conversation with mentoring in developing school leaders' skills? And that's a question by Dr. Yasmin. From yeah, the that's, that's such a good question. Thank you for asking. Because, you know, I think there is a very fine line between coaching and mentoring. And um, I, I know because of my experience that uh, people um, hire me for coaching. But then when I get to talk to them, I understand that they've hired me for mentoring them because of my experience. 
Um, so it's a question of hats, right? We go, we go back to the De Bono hats, but those time maybe the powery hats, right? Where at some point I'm going to be uh, Nadine, the coach, and at some point I'm going to be Nadine, the mentor. And I make sure that um, I ask them permission to remove my hat of a coach to then put my, my hat of a mentor. I always ask permission. And if I, in a coaching session, of course you can give, um, you can give an advice, but you need to ask permission. You need to make it sure that they understand that you're actually, you know, borderline. It's okay to do it, but not too, too frequently because otherwise you become a mentor and mentoring is something else. Okay, thank you, Nadine, for that. Uh, there's another question here. How to um, help students, it's in Arabic, uh, how to help students with special needs uh, learn effective language or effective communication among them? Okay, so, them. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, usually I am very keen on, temp I'm very keen on first simplicity, right? Let's have a very simple model because the more complexity it is the less people are, you know, and students are going to understand. And so make it simple. Um, identify what precisely you want them to learn in the language, right? And repeat, 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 reinforce, repeat, reinforce, and then expand, but little by little. So chunk what you are doing. I think if you do that, you will see an improvement. And also, um, let them take responsibility because you know what? They can be very good at doing that if they see that you are trusting them and praise. Every time they do something great, just praise and pause, right? So that they hear what you're saying and celebrate and make it very visual. So for example, again, in the best schools where I've inspected, you know, people use um, CISO, um, take quick picture, they do the recording, bang, they send it to parents. I think it's wonderful, right? So just celebrate every time somebody, a student, a staff is doing something amazing and just share. Okay, another question here from Asmahan. How can I, as a leader, do coaching with a large number of teachers? Besides, how can coaching be successful with talented students? So it's a two-part question. So uh, the first part is about coaching with a large number of teachers. Okay, well, it depends. I mean, first of all, it depends what large is, okay? Um, I think it's possible to do, I mean, I've done coaching with my staff. Um, so it's, it, 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 first of all, it depends how you are confident as a coach, right? If you're very confident, I think you can walk in and I think you can do it easily. Um, I think if you are not confident, it's going to be a little bit problematic. So first of all, start with you and do um, um, a diagnostic assessment about where you are as a coach. And if you're ready, go for it. If you're not, then speak to another coach to see how you can do it. That would be my advice. Um, the way to do it as well, sometimes can help. Depends to, I go back to my questions, like why do you want to coach them? Why you, why not an external coach? Okay, the question needs to be asked. Um, I did have external coaches coming to my school as well, because I saw that that would, uh, I saw that my staff would have different kinds of conversations uh, and that works well. Um, and you may want to perhaps think about starting with the whole group and then going into smaller groups, depending on, you know, your criteria or what you're trying to achieve. But there are certain ways, you know, there are certainly many ways to, to do it, but it all starts with you and your why. I think let's be clear. And what was the second question? How to deal with talented students. Ah, how to deal with talented students, right? Well, I mean, you know, coaching is ideal for them because uh, for me here, it would be about uh, the disruptive uh, side of coaching, the disruptive leadership um, and, and making sure that, um, you know, the why, why are you doing this now and how can you do that better and how can you do that quicker? Um, I think for me, it would be the questions that uh, elevate and accelerate their thinking. I think it's very nice to work with um, talented students for you know reasons that um, you can push them in different directions and also you can make them grow as individuals um, yeah okay uh, we'll take the last question and then we finish off so the last question is how can we as leaders um, um, drive change in a community that resists change i like that question ah yeah yeah of <laughs> course resistance resistance Right. 
Well, I, I mean, I think that uh, that person needs to do the exercise that I have given at the end of my presentation, because it's about knowing your community. And if they are resistant, resistant, it's actually understanding the, what makes them resistant, right? And maybe the question that you want to uh, ask is, okay, what's in it for me? Like thinking about them. If you were them, what's in it for them, right? What makes, what makes them resistant and understanding the barriers? And sometimes it may be because uh, um, you want to bring something completely new and they have no idea, they don't understand. So sometimes it may just be about your communication, like you've not communicated your plan well enough. Sometimes they may, they may feel threatened, you know, if you are saying that perhaps you're going to be reducing staff, um, you know, they may feel threatened by that. And it's explaining, again, it's explaining the, the why, the rational, um, the positive um, side of, of that change, um, the why you've decided to make the change and the options that you had with that change and the why you've decided to go with that particular option. And also the, the, you know, the, the making sure that you keep having a dialogue with those people and that you are removing barriers, questions and answers and you publish and you share that with them you know, to the point where they've got no more questions to ask because you've answered them all and clearly, um, there is no reason to be afraid because they understand. Most of the time, it's about communication and it's because they don't get what's in it for them or they see the change as a threat. So remember, um, remember the transition. It's the transition that you need to um, perhaps focus on and spend more time on that, explaining how, what it would look like. Yes. Okay. Okay, I think that takes us to the end of the session today. Thank you so much, Nadine, for that talk. It was really ins insightful, and I'm I'm sure that uh, we'll start thinking uh, deeply about our choices and about our decisions in in life in general and in um, in the prof in professional in our professional uh, level as well. Thank you so much, Nadine. It's uh, it's great to have you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you link today's session. Uh, just to highlight that the recording of this webinar will be available tomorrow on QRTA YouTube channel. Um, thank you so much for your participation and we hope to see you soon in our coming QRTA talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you everyone.